Dating back to ancient Greece, Olympic Games have been held periodically to honor the world's most superior athletes in a variety of sporting competitions. And as we have learned in this series, all types of substances interact with each other and ultimately change. And in order for this change to take place, it requires all the substances involved to move a special way and have a certain level of energy, just like the athletes in the Olympics. And this is the basis for what we will be discussing today. So lace up those kicks, get a nice big stretch of that brain of yours, and get ready to ignite the torch. Because the chemical Olympics has begun. International Sports Festival and to do so people around the world of all walks of life come together where those games are being held at. In chemistry the start of any chemical reaction must also begin with the coming together of substances. So our chemical Olympics begins with the collision theory which states that atoms, ions, and molecules must collide with one another in order for a chemical reaction to begin. The collision theory also states that the collisions must be effective, meaning for that chemical change to occur, the substances colliding must have the proper three-dimensional orientation and enough energy when they collide. Once the atoms, ions, or molecules have collided with enough energy and proper orientation, the chemical reaction can take place. But the speed or how fast this reaction takes place at which we call the reaction rate, depends on several factors. When it comes to the reaction rate of a chemical change, substances that contain ionic bonds always win the race and react faster than those with covalent bonds because the atoms in ionic bonds require less energy to break apart and thus are more readily available to collide and make that change happen. As you increase the temperature of a reaction vessel, the reactants in there have more energy when they collide, thus leading to more collisions between the substances and a faster rate of reaction in that reaction vessel that has a higher temperature. When you increase the number of particles in a given volume, or in other words, you increase the concentration of a substance, there will be more substances in there to collide, leading to more collisions and an increased rate of reaction. As the surface area of a substance increases, like when you take a solid lump and you crush it into powder, you are allowing more particles to interact with each other, and this in turn, yes you guessed it, makes the reaction rate go faster. And the final factor affecting reaction rate, a catalyst, which is a substance that remains unchanged by a reaction, but when added to the reaction, provides a boost to it kind of like a can of energy drink, by allowing for these substances to interact with each other through alternate or shorter pathways, thus leading to a faster reaction. To perform at a top level, athletes in the Olympics need to prepare and warm up for the event. So our athletes, the atoms, ions, and molecules, also need to harness some energy in order to interact with one another. To display the amount of heat energy that is absorbed and released during a chemical reaction, a potential energy diagram is used, which has energy on the y-axis and the extent of the reaction, how long it takes, on the x-axis. On a potential energy diagram, the reactants will have the energy shown on the flat line at the beginning part of the curve, at the left side of the curve, the top of the curve represents the amount of energy required to start the reaction, which we call the activation energy, and the products will have the energy shown on the flat line at the end of the curve, which is on the right side of the curve. The difference in the energy levels between where the reactants are located and where the products are located for a chemical reaction is called the heat of reaction, or enthalpy, 
And by looking at the positions of those flat lines for the reactants and products, you can determine if a chemical reaction is endothermic or exothermic. During an endothermic reaction, heat is absorbed and delta H, the change in enthalpy, is positive, so energy is going in. So the flat line representing the reactants is positioned lower on the curve than the flat lines representing the products. And in exothermic reactions where heat is released and delta H is negative, the flat lines are in opposite positions than what they would be in endothermic reactions. And as we mentioned earlier, a catalyst will provide a shorter or alternate route for those reactants, which means that they allow for the reaction to take place with a lower amount of activation energy. So we show a catalyst being used in a reaction on a potential energy diagram by drawing a line on the diagram that has the top of the curve that is lower than where the top of the curve is for the uncatalyzed reaction, which allows for the reaction to take place faster. Now that we know the type of energy required for our chemical athletes to react with one another, let's talk about what determines if our athletes will even compete in the first place. What do you think your chances are at beating Michael Phelps at a 100 meter butterfly or Usain Bolt at a 100 meter dash? Because guess what? In chemistry, we have a numerical value that does just that. It determines the chances of something happening or not. In the chemical Olympics, the likelihood of atoms, ions, or molecules colliding and reacting with each other relates to how spontaneous the reaction is. And a measurement of the randomness of a reaction or the disorder of a substance is what we call entropy and we represent entropy with the letter S. Entropy is randomness and disorder. So a substance that is in the physical state of a solid, where all of those particles in there are really closely, tightly packed together, will have less disorder and therefore less entropy than if that same substance was a liquid or gas, and those particles were more spaced apart, leading to more disorder and randomness and more entropy. During any physical change that has an increase in the amount of disorder or randomness, like a phase change from a solid to liquid to gas, or the creation of a mixture of two or more substances, including when you dissolve a solute in a solvent, the change in entropy, or delta S, will be positive because entropy is increasing. As for a chemical change where matter is rearranged and something new is made, the reaction is considered spontaneous and will occur if the heat of the reaction, that enthalpy we just discussed, will decrease and the entropy of the change increases. Now that you know how our chemical athletes come together to begin the Olympic Games, aka the collision theory, what affects their speed, which we call the rate of reaction, how they utilize energy, which we show in the potential energy diagrams, and how we know if they will even compete or not, which we see in a spontaneous reaction. I want you to try out these practice problems right here and then take a nice long break for the intermission of the chemical practice. the race is over and a victor is crowned, instead of celebrating their glorious victories, some of our chemical athletes actually start the race over and go from the finish line back to the start line. What this actually means is that if the products formed from a chemical change can react with each other after they are made and reform the reactants that were there at the start, then this chemical reaction is known as a reversible reaction. Physical changes, like liquid water evaporating to steam, can also be reversible. But just like our amazing human Olympic athletes, our chemical athletes are not really going to do this unless they get some help. And we can give them some help by changing the type of system that the reaction takes place in. An example of this is when you leave a glass of water 
on a starting line. And the water ends up evaporating because the liquid molecules want more disorder, which they can have if they get into the gas phase. And without a cover on that glass, the water molecules end up getting enough energy over time to make that change happen from the liquid to the gas phase. The uncovered glass of water is considered an open system because it's open. But if you were to put a cover on that same glass, you will be able to prevent all of the water molecules from getting enough energy to change, thus creating what is known as a closed system. Within a closed system, all the reactant and product molecules are mixed together, waiting to either go forward towards the product side of the reaction, producing products, or go in reverse towards the reactant side of the reaction, producing more reactants. And this dynamic within the closed system creates another race between the reactants and the products on who's going to produce what first. At the start of this closed system race, the rate of the forward reaction will be faster than the rate of the reverse reaction. But because it is a closed system, this race never ends and will reach a point eventually where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And when this happens, this race is said to be at equilibrium. Equilibrium is a dynamic condition represented by arrows going in both directions in a chemical equation where the rates of opposing processes are equal or balanced to each other. And there are three types of equilibriums that determine the types of processes that will be racing towards being equal to each other. Phase equilibrium occurs when the rate of one phase change is equal to the rate of the opposing phase change, like our example of the covered glass of water, where the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. Solution equilibrium occurs in saturated solutions when the rate at which the solute dissolves in the solvent is equal to the rate of crystallization of that same solute. So if I were to add salt to this glass of water right here, and the salt water mixture reach solution equilibrium, then that means the salt particles in that water will be dissolving and crystallizing at the same speed. Lastly, during chemical equilibrium, the rates of forward and reverse reactions are equal. And with products and reactants being made at the same speed, the amount of substances in that particular system will remain the same. So the concentrations of products and reactants in a system at chemical equilibrium is not necessarily equal, but they will remain constant while that system's at equilibrium. As we have all witnessed over the years, speed is a major component of success in many of the contests that take place in the Olympic Games. But in some competitions, like in gymnastics, athletes focus on other skill sets, such as being able to support their body positions, perfecting their jumping and leaping abilities, and most importantly, preserving and maintaining proper balance throughout their routines. In the Chemical Olympics, equilibrium is balanced, and our atoms, ions, and molecules will attempt to maintain this balance through what we call Le Chatier's Principle, which describes the behavior of a system at equilibrium when the reaction is disturbed by an externally induced stress, or in other words, when we throw it off balance. Le Chatier's principle states that when a stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the system becomes unbalanced and responds by reacting towards the direction that will correct the change caused by the induced stress, thus restoring the former balance of the system and bringing it back to equilibrium. In the Chemical Olympics, there are three types of stresses that can be applied to a system to disturb it and throw it off balance, including temperature, pressure, and any type of change to the amount of reactants and products, meaning the changes in concentrations of the substances in that system. Changing the concentration of any substance in a system at equilibrium will cause the system to shift towards the reaction side that is away from that increase. So if you were to add more ammonia gas to a system containing the Haber reaction, the system will become unbalanced due to the excess amount of products and will shift to the left side, the reactant side, and produce more nitrogen and hydrogen gas until the system balances itself out and reaches equilibrium again. 
In this same system, if I were to remove nitrogen gas from the system, it will become unbalanced due to the limited amount of reactants and will shift to the left again, the reactant side, and produce more reactants until it balances itself out again. When applying the stress of pressure to a system at equilibrium, solids and liquids are not really phased by it, but gases are. So the system shift when pressure is applied is based on the number of moles of gases involved in the chemical reaction. In the Haber reaction, four total moles of gases, one from nitrogen and three from hydrogen, react to produce two moles of ammonia gas, meaning that there are more moles of gas and volume on the reactant side of this process. So an increase of pressure will put the system off balance because the reactants will have less space to react, therefore shifting the system to the product side and producing ammonia gas because there are fewer gas molecules on the product side than on the reactant side. The last stress, temperature, is a little tricky, but as we know, a chemical reaction can be endothermic, meaning heat is absorbed and delta H is positive, or exothermic, meaning heat is released and change in enthalpy is negative. And this thermodynamic data is represented as a substance in a chemical equation. And we do so by using the words heat or energy or the actual numerical enthalpy value as a reactant when the chemical reaction is endothermic or as a product when the reaction is exothermic. When heat is added or removed from a system at equilibrium, the system will react and shift towards the side that will counter that excess or loss of heat. So if you add heat to an endothermic reaction that is already absorbing heat, the system will shift towards the product side and produce products to use up and balance that excess heat. And if you cooled an exothermic reaction that is already releasing heat, the system will also shift to the product side to produce products and make up for that loss of heat. Well, that does it, everybody. Our chemical Olympics has finally ended. And for our closing ceremony, I want you to take some laps around these practice problems. Man. Yeah.